And today we have a panel of um, our team members um, at Coconino County, our co-workers that are here to share um, a little bit about their thoughts um, regarding Hispanic Heritage Month. So we're um, going to go to our sixth panelist, and that is Marco Alatore. And Marco, your question is, when dealing with a non-diverse environment or individuals with little experience with diversity, how would you approach making diversity, equity, and inclusion relevant or valued? Buenas tardes. Me llamo Marco Alatore. Buenas tardes. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Uh, uh, and that's seven seconds, which is widely regarded as the time frame necessary to make a first impression. Um, so, rhetorical question for you. What was your first impression of me? Perhaps this audience is more understanding, but you can imagine that the average person might be more taken aback by the juxtaposition of someone who, at first glance, might appear as if they wouldn't speak fluent English versus a moment later hearing them drop a word like juxtaposition. Uh, so the question that I chose to address for this discussion was, when dealing with a non-diverse environment or individuals with little experience with diversity, how would you approach making diversity, equity, and inclusion relevant or valued? And my short answer to that question would be to help everyone truly grasp the concept of unconscious bias. So let me get back to trying to explain that. Like I said, my name is Marco Alatorre, although it's always sized to Marco Alatorre. That name often gives people an initial impression that I've been told by far too many people, frankly, is a lot different from how they come to think of me once they get to know me. My surname is only Hispanic because our society is patriarchal and my paternal grandfather came from Mexico, but my mother is white. Um, and she was a stay-at-home mom when I was young, while my father was a breadwinner, so between working full-time and my mother not speaking it, my father never really had the opportunity to teach me his first language, so I don't even speak fluent Spanish. Um, I spent my formative years in a largely white society because after I showed considerable cognitive aptitude through things like consistently scoring in the top one or two percentiles on standardized tests, I got into gifted programs starting in fourth grade and continuing through the end of high school, where with very few exceptions, I never met another person of Hispanic heritage. I should mention that because of this, I have next to no personal experience with the struggles that most Hispanic people have living in the society, Barring interactions where the only thing the other party really knows about me is my name. And you might not think that that would amount to much, but you'll probably be surprised. After earning academic full tuition scholarships to multiple universities, I ended up graduating from the University of Arizona in 2011 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Systems Engineering with an emphasis in sustainability, having qualified for the College of Engineering Dean's List. Seems like a pretty decent trajectory, right? But then I started applying for jobs. Uh, at this point, allow me to read from a 2017 study on race and employment. Quote, a new study by researchers at Northwestern University, Harvard, and the Institute for Social Research in Norway looked at every available field experiment on hiring discrimination from 1989 through 2015. Researchers sent out resumes with similar levels of education, experience, and so on, but the names differ, so resumes have a stereotypically black or Latino name, and the others have a stereotypically white name. They concluded that, on average, white applicants receive 24% um, more callbacks than Latinos. So, what was my experience? Well, starting a few months before graduation and continuing for about a year, I applied for almost a hundred entry-level engineering positions with what was objectively a pretty strong resume and customized cover letters. And the results? I did get one response declining to interview me, and all of the rest of the companies that I applied to didn't even bother to turn me down. Granted, 2011 was not a great time to graduate as the world was still recovering from the Great Recession and a lot of people were having a hard time finding work, but it seems pretty telling that all of my white classmates that I kept in contact with, most of whom had lower GPAs than me, were eventually able to find work in engineering positions. Many of them have gone on to have very successful engineering careers so far and now work for companies ranging from Tesla and SpaceX to multinational construction and energy corporations, and they tend to make six-figure annual salaries where by comparison, I work as a residential property appraiser and had a before-tax gross income of about $36,000 last year. Unconscious bias can make us think less of each other, um, 
consequences of lower importance include microaggressions, like when people tell me that I'm much more well-spoken than they expect, or when a close friend asks me whether I find being called Mexican offensive. It's just the name of the country that my grandfather came from. No, I don't find it offensive, but him asking the question was because of the implication that in his world, the term Mexican might have a derogatory connotation. More toward the middle of the relative scale of importance are consequences like lost job opportunities, but even though it may have been the cause of me missing out on an engineering career, I actually consider myself lucky because at its most serious, unconscious bias can make people think so much less of others that they begin to become dehumanized. So, I apologize in advance for this last part being a little bit uncomfortable, but as the legendary Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, speak your mind even if your voice shakes. No matter what your views on immigration are, everyone ought to agree that we should treat all people like human beings. It was great that the family separation policy that was implemented at the U.S. border with Mexico in 2018 was almost universally condemned and ended shortly thereafter. But most people, if they even did so much as post about it on social media, once the policy was ended, seemed to think, job well done, problem solved. But it isn't. Dehumanization of immigrants is still rampant. Just two weeks ago, a whistleblower at an Immigration and Customs Enforcement facility in Georgia came forward to report that the center is performing mass hysterectomies. In light of these unwanted sterilizations, one immigrant in the complaint put it best, this place is not equipped for humans. And even the family separation issue isn't over in that a lot of those children will likely be traumatized for life, considering that when they were finally reunited with their parents, it often resulted in situations like this. Esta separación fue muy larga, mi hijo ya ha cambiado mucho. Con tanto trauma. Ya no quiero ser tu hijo, ya no soy tu hijo, me dijo. It's really hard to see unconscious bias or its effects unless you really look for it and are willing to have uncomfortable conversations or at least consume content that makes you uncomfortable. Um, I know it can be hard to know where to find quality content, much less someone willing to have uncomfortable conversations, but it's really important. So even though my time is up, I'd be happy to continue this discussion in any context with anyone that is willing to do that work. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. Really appreciate you sharing and look forward to continuing the conversation with you. It's, it's uh, important that we continue at the county to have these uh, conversations. And as you mentioned, as uncomfortable as they may be. So now we're going to hear from